This video was brought to you by Indently.io, learning Python made simple. How's it going everyone? In today's video, we're going to be learning about five of my favorite functions in ITER tools. And these are the ones I find very useful and very good to know about. Starting with number one, batched. And as the very first thing, we're going to import from ITER tools batched so we can use it directly. Now, in this example, we're going to have some numbers of type list of integer. That's going to equal one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. Next, we can create a batched object. So I'm going to call this my batch, which will be of type batched. And we can just call the function directly. And what it takes is the data to batch, which is going to be the numbers in this case, and the amount of batches to create. And you can either do it by specifying n, or you can do it without n. For this example, I'm just going to keep it there because I like having that there. It just makes it more clear what I'm providing. Now, if we were to print this batch, so if we were to print my batch, what we would get back is a batched object, which is just an iterator object, which means to actually see the data, we're either going to have to call next on this, or we're going to have to convert it into a data type, which actually allows us to visualize that data, such as a list. So if we were to do that and run our script, you're going to notice that we're going to get three batches back. And the third batch is going to be of a shorter length because there were no more elements. So it just did the best it could to create a batch of three elements here, but ended up with only one. Now, I do not recommend you convert it to a list immediately because the whole reason for creating an iterator is to take advantage of memory because iterators are incredibly memory efficient. But just to visualize the data, we can convert it to a list or to a tuple or to anything that actually extracts this data. Now, if we were to change n to four, we would get different batch sizes and we can even change it to two if that's what you want. And it will create four batches. And once again, this is useful for grabbing information slowly. So if we were to use the next method, we will get the first element back from this iterator on demand. If we do it again, we will get the next element. And this is the right way to use this iterator. We're only grabbing the information we need without loading all of it into memory. Moving on to my second favorite iter tools function, zip longest. Now in Python, as part of the built-ins, we have zip, which works quite well. It does everything it needs to and is actually incredibly similar to zip longest. But now I'm going to show you the benefit of using zip longest. So to get started, I'm going to just copy and paste these in. So we have three lists here, one which is a list of type string that contains these names, one that's a list of type integer, which contains these numbers, and finally one which is a list of type string, which contains these symbols. And what we want to do here is zip them. So we're going to create an object, which is going to be a zip longest object. And that's going to equal zip longest with the following names, numbers, and symbols. And one more thing that's important to note here is that all of these are of different lengths. Now, if we were to print this zipped object, we would get an iterator back, which again is incredibly memory efficient. So what we're going to do is convert this to a list just so we can see the data. And now if we were to run this, what we should get back is our data combined. So we have Bob, one yen, Joe, two euro, Jam, three percent, and so on. Now what you're going to notice here, which is different than the original zip, is that if elements are missing, by default, it's just going to use none as a fill element. With the original zip, we do not get this. It will only zip this up until here. And we can actually verify that just by typing in zip, which is no longer going to be a zip longest object. So my pie is going to complain, but we can still run it. And you'll notice that we're only going to get three elements back here. So let's change that back to zip longest because there's one more thing I want to show you. And that is that we can specify which fill element we want by typing in fill value. So for example, we can pass in the value of false, or you can pass in your custom string, whatever you want to use as a fill value, you can specify that here. So that the next time we run this, for all the values that are missing, it's just going to insert that value. Moving on to my third favorite iter tools function, product. And what it does is create the Cartesian product of the input iterables. And that's actually ripped right from the documentation. And I know that can be quite hard to explain, so I'm just going to show you exactly what it does. And to do so, I'm going to create some elements, which will be a list of type string. And inside here, we'll type in A, B, and C. 
And pretty much what product does is create every possible combination of these values. For example, we can create my product, which will be of type product, and that's going to equal the product of the elements and the amount we want it to repeat for. So here we can type in repeat and three. Now with this, we're going to type in for tuple in my product print quotes dot join, and we're going to join that tuple just so you can see what this contains. Now, when we run this, what you're going to notice is that we're going to get every combination of these three elements put together. So AAA, and then once we get all the way to the bottom of ACC, we start with BAA, and then finally CAA, all the way to CCC. So this covers every possible combination of these three characters or these three elements. And the reason I use dot join here is because if we were just to print the tuple, it doesn't look as pretty. But as you can see, it returns to us a tuple of the elements in every possible combination. Now, if you were to change the repeat value to something such as two, it's going to check every possible combination up to the length of two elements. So AA, AB, AC, BA, BB, BC, and so on. You can even do it with four and it will check for all the combinations with a length of four. And I really like this it's a tools function because it's just so simple to use. And when you want to know every single possible combination of something, it just makes sense to use something as efficient as an iterator for it. Up next, we have my fourth favorite it's a tools function, star map. And star map is just a slight variation of the original map function that we have in Python. But to show you how it actually works, we're going to create a function called get sum. And in this example, it's going to take three arguments, a of type int, b of type int, and c of type int. And it's going to return to us an integer. Now, all we're going to do here is return the sum of a, b, and c as a tuple. It's a very simple function. Next, we're going to create some data, which will be a list of tuple of type int, int, and int. And that's going to contain one, two, three, and four, five, and six. That's going to be our data. Next, we can create something called sums, which is going to be of type star map. And that's going to equal star map with our function get sum. And as you can see, this takes three arguments and the data that we want to insert, which is going to be the data. And what makes this different from the original map is that we can insert multiple arguments into this function. So right now, if we were to print the list of sums, you'll notice that it's going to work beautifully. We're going to get the list of sums using our function. So this was able to insert these three arguments into the get sum function each time we ran it. And this didn't really have to be three integers. You could have easily just have inserted args of type integer and then just pass in the arguments here and remove the parentheses and it should work exactly the same way. I just wanted to show you that you could pass in multiple arguments into that function. Now, another example of using this would be with the power function. So this time we're going to change up the data to contain only two elements per tuple. And the first one will contain the values of two and four, followed by three and three, and finally four and two. And instead of using get sum, we're going to pass in pow. And we will rename this two powers because that makes more sense. And now when we run this, we should get the power back for each one of these elements. So two to the fourth power, three to the third power, and four to the second power. And just like that, we were able to pass in these two arguments into power each time we ran that function. And finally, let's move on to the final function of this video, which is going to be the group by function. And this is personally one of my favorites because it's incredibly useful, even if it can be quite tricky to get a hang of. But to show you how it works, we're going to create a function called count vowels. And that's going to take some text or a word of type string. Best to follow the script I have on my phone and that will return an integer. And first of all, inside here, we're going to create a vowel count of type integer, which will be set to zero. Now for letter in the word, if the letter is in A, E, I, O, U, A, E, I, O, U. So we cover all the cases then we're going to increment the vowel count by one. So vowel count plus equals one. And finally, we just need to return the vowel count. So now we have a function that counts vowels. Next, we need some data to actually use this on. So what we're going to do, or actually what I'm going to do is paste in 
these words, which is a list of type string that contains cat, dog, mood, banana, red, hood, and mate. As you can see, all of these contain vowels. And what we want to do is group these by the amount of vowels each one contains. But the very first thing we need to do is sort these words. So sorted words of type list of string is going to equal sorted. And here we're going to have to pass in the words and the key is going to be set to count vowels. So it's going to sort them by the amount of vowels. And this is very important for a group by. Everything has to be in order to actually work. For example, cat needs to be next to dog if we want to group them together. And I actually have a full video on group by in case you want to learn more about it. And I'll just leave that in the description box down below. So just click on that link if you want to learn more about group by. This video is just going to be a quick introduction to how it works. Anyway, next we need to create a grouped object, which is going to be of type group by, and that's going to be an iterator, but that's going to equal group by, and inside here we pass in the sorted words with the key being set to count vowels. And finally, let's display this information. So four vowels and grouped words in grouped, print the F string of vowels equals and the list of grouped words. And now when we run this, what we should get back are the groups that we specified. As you can see, the words that contain only one vowel will be grouped together. And then the ones that contain two vowels will also be grouped together. And then the same thing for three vowels. And this is just a very good function to know about because it makes grouping so much easier, even if it takes a bit more time to learn because you need to sort it each time before you actually group the elements. But once you figure that out, it's a very simple function to use. Anyway, that just about covers everything I wanted to talk about in today's video. Do let me know in the comment section down below whether you have anything you would like to add or if you're still confused about anything. But otherwise, with all that being said, as always, thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video.